you've been an FBI special agent uh, pursuing Al-Qaeda, and yet you're writing about Al-Qaeda and its growth 18 years or so uh, after 9-11. And yet, in the book, you're not shocked that we're still talking about Al-Qaeda and its growth. That's the reason I wrote the book. 17 years after 9-11 and Al-Qaeda today is way more dangerous than it used to be. The narrative of Osama bin Laden is way more popular in the world today than it used to be on 9-11. Al-Qaeda on 9-11 had 400 members, 400 pledged members who gave bay'a to Osama bin Laden. 19 of them were killed on that day. Al-Qaeda today have thousands and thousands of people in branches all across the Muslim world have more uh, youth that believes in the narrative of Osama bin Laden that we had before 9-11. That is the reason I wrote the book. I needed to explain, uh, uh, you know, the, 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 the failure mm. uh, of, uh, of this war uh, on terrorism. Was how the war on terror was fought also a major factor in this, in terms of using black sites, rendition, enhanced interrogation techniques? Has that been part of the reason that they Re-emerged? Absolutely. That's essential in our failure. Essential in our failure. Al-Qaeda by 2003 uh, was, di was a dying breed. Uh, you know, most of their members have been either killed or apprehended. Uh, 2003, with the invasion of Iraq, gave them new oxygen, gave them in, in new blood, it created a chaotic situation in Iraq, destroyed a state, uh, unbalanced the, the, the whole region, and allowed Al-Qaeda and other extremist groups and offshoots of Al-Qaeda like ISIS uh, to exist. Uh, black sites, uh, Gu uh, Guantanamo Bay, uh, the prison in Guantanamo Bay, um, you know, some of the uh, strategies uh, behind drone attacks, a lot of these kind of, you know, tactics fed into the narrative, the narrative of Osama bin Laden, that the West, and especially the United States, is basically anti uh, the Muslim world. And uh, unfortunately, more and more people believe in this today than we had on 9-11. Is it worse now? I mean, because one of the things, I mean, th the change between the Obama administration and the Trump administration is very radical in how they see it. Donald Trump is all about, you know, using, you know, enhanced technique, using sort of torture. He says he wants, you know, the U.S. And intelligence sure. agencies to really, you know, use whatever means they they feel sure. comfortable. Is that what you're talking about? Does that feed into what? Well, what de definitely that feeds. I mean, we we've seen a lot of strategies in the past. The Iraq War is one of them. Black sites, one of them. Torture is one of them, or so-called enhanced interrogation techniques. Uh, you know, Guantanamo Bay is one of them. Uh, some of the tactics that we did uh, prior to the Arab Spring can also be included. But also some of the rhetoric that's coming from President Trump is not helpful. You know, uh, having Muslim bans, uh, that does not help uh, promoting the idea that America is not an enemy of, of, of the Muslim world. Um, you know, uh, uh, trying to um, have this idea that we're going to bring waterboarding and wars and waterboarding and, and, and torture, actually. He, he, that, he, he's not able to do it, and he won't be able to do it because Congress passed a lot of flaws um, after uh, that dark era in our history. Uh, so it's uh, impossible for any agency to bring it back without congressional approval. And I don't see Congress meeting and say, hey, we're voting for torture. I, I don't think that's happening. How does the young Ali Soufan today you know, go about you know, confronting al-Qaeda in the way that you did in 2005 with this controversy still around about torture and things like that? Well, we'll approach it the same way. Uh, you know, most of the people in the intelligence community and law enforcement and in, in, in the CIA and the FBI and in the military, um, we did it the right way. We conducted interrogations the right way. Uh, they, uh, there was a group of people with contractors and all the things now in public. Uh, the, the Senate did uh, a very detailed report on that. The CIA did an inspector general report on that, um, you know, who basically went overboard. And, and these techniques that they applied did not produce Use any actionable intelligence, and it's not me saying that it did not it did not produce any actionable intelligence. The CIA's own Inspector General said, uh, not one single terrorist plot was stopped, an imminent threat was stopped because of of torture. So we will approach it the same way. Um, you know, when your tactics, when your strategy, is in sync with your laws and your moral values, you will win. How do we go from that? point where you know London was this kind of media hub for al-Qaeda to today where a lot of young British Muslims I mean about you know 800 or so have gone to places like Syria and Iraq to fight for 
uh, uh, not only just al-Qaeda, but also ISIS. That put significant pressure on uh, the intelligence and uh, law enforcement services in the UK to deal with, with that threat. And I'm not saying all the returnees pose the same mm. threat. They differ uh, in the threat that they pose. But that indicates that there is a network that's helping that ideology, helping that narrative um, you know, um, to spread in the United Kingdom and uh, to make l uh, young Muslim youth uh, feel uh, isolated, feel alienated, feel that they are not part of their system. And that is the reason that they go to join something else, because they really don't feel British enough. They don't feel that this society is actually giving them a fair share. And as long as we allow these kind of Islamophobia uh, to, 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 to fester itself in the United Kingdom, unfortunately, we will always have uh, this type of uh, threat. In the last few days, the Home Secretary has talked about MI5 sharing information with not just, you know, Muslim communities, businesses, civil organizations. Do you think that's the way forward? Well, I, I think, um, you know, in, in the book, I talk about a holistic approach to deal with it. And I think in the recent uh, uh, prevent uh, strategy, mm. uh, I think we, we started to see, um, you know, uh, a larger kind of inclusiveness in focusing outside only the Muslim groups, recognizing that there are other hate groups and terrorist groups, recognizing the importance of the private business, recognizing the importance of platforms and digital and social media. And we have to bring everybody in. Um, it takes a network to take down a network. Are we looking, are we going to be still talking about this in another 18 or 20 years, do you think? I don't know about 18 and 20 years, but if we continue on the same path, yes. And I think it might be probably even more dangerous then. Um, You've been particularly critical of the war in Yemen, led by Saudi Arabia and uh, the United uh, Arab Emirates. And what do you think will be the consequences? And why are you focused at the moment on, on, on Yemen uh, in terms of the growth of al-Qaeda and, and, and of its offshoots? Well, what's happening in Yemen is a catastrophe. Uh, so. Yeah. Right. What's happening in Yemen is disastrous, uh, frankly, and it will have long-term implications. You have a whole country that's being surrounded, that's being bombed, more than 10,000 people killed, 60,000 people injured, half the schools have been destroyed, and millions of children are growing up without any education. Uh, most of the population, up to uh, 18 million, um, you know, uh, under the risk of starvation, one million cholera cases, in heaven's sake. Uh, this is in the 21st century in a country uh, one of the poorest country in the region in, in the world that's being bombed and being destroyed by some of the richest countries in the world and, and i think eventually uh, whatever happens in yemen uh, it's going to have a long-term consequences not only in yemen and the arabian peninsula but also uh, across uh, the gulf of aden into, into somalia and other places as, as we know now al-qaeda and al-shabaab ha has always mm. cooperated with each mm. other but now they are cooperating more al-qaeda in yemen for example um, used to be less, one th less than 1,000 member before the war. Now they are over 6,000. So that gives you an idea about the spread of extremism. That fits into the narrative of the management of savagery. And we have now in the West, the United States, and even our friends in Saudi Arabia and the UAE, there is something. What are you trying to accomplish in Yemen? Are you trying to stop Iran or are you trying to fight Al-Qaeda? Because if you're trying to fight Al-Qaeda... You're going about it the wrong way. You're going saying. about it the wrong way. If you're trying to fight Iran, then Al-Qaeda is going to become stronger. And that is going to be a threat against Saudi Arabia and the UAE down the road and against the whole entire world. So I think we're doing something in Yemen that have no strategic value to any of the people that's involved. I understand that we have to contain Iran, but you can do it diplomatically, you can do it politically, uh, without starving the whole Yemeni population to the point that many of the Yemenis, especially down in South Yemen, start to see the UAE as an occupation force, not a force that's there to help them. And that's why I believe I'm speaking out about Yemen, uh, because it is really important to know what's going on. And these kind of things that we don't pay attention to eventually, come back to you know, become, you know, th these thread lines, we don't really pay attention to them, but eventually they become very strong fault lines. And then we have commissions about them later on saying, oh, how did this happen?